Hello, BookTube. We are reading The Hound of the Baskervilles, Arthur Conan Doyle's thrilling novel. We're doing this for uh, Holmes is Where the Heart Is, <laughs> a, a BookTube event that is brand new. And we are up to Chapter 8 in the story of the cursed Baskerville family. The last heir of that family, Sir Henry Baskerville, has gone down to Baskerville Hall to beard the lion and stand, to face the, the supernatural rumors that are haunting his family, and defy them to do their worst. And his companion is Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes says that he's too busy to leave London at the moment, so he sends Watson, but he wants detailed reports from Watson. We've been getting everything from Watson's point of view, and it's been very interesting. A few of you have pointed out that Watson is a keen observer, as keen an observer as Holmes, and, crucially, a keen observer of human elements that Holmes would ignore. Uh, well done on Doyle's part. Uh, and in Chapter 8, we Chapter 8 is the first report of that Dr. Watson is sending home to Sherlock Holmes. Uh, from this point onwards, I will follow the course of events by transcribing my own letters to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, which lie before me on the table. One page is missing, but otherwise they are exactly as written, and show my feelings and suspicion of the moment more accurately than my memory, clear as it is upon these tragic events, can possibly do. So, the first, the first dispatch is dated Baskerville Hall, October the 13th. My dear Holmes, my previous letters and telegrams have kept you pretty well up to date as to all that has occurred on this most godforsaken corner of the world. <laughs> the longer one stays here, the more does the spirit of the moor sink into one's soul, its vastness, and also its grim charm. When you, are once but, you, when you are once but upon its bosom, you have left all traces of modern England behind you. But on the other hand, you are conscious everywhere of the homes and work of the prehistoric people. On all sides as you walk, you are, are, are the houses of those forgotten people, with their graves and huge monoliths which are supposed to have marked their temples. As you look at their gray stone huts against the scarred hillsides, you leave your own age behind you. And if you were to see a skin-clad, hairy man crawl out from a low door, fitting a flint-tipped arrow on the string of his bow, you would feel that his presence were more natural than your own. The strange thing is that they should have lived so thickly on what must have been so, so much so, the most unfruitful soil. I am no antiquarian, but I could imagine that they were some unwarlike and harried people who were forced to accept that which none would occupy. All this, however, is foreign to the mission on which you sent me, and will probably be very uninteresting to your severely practical mind. I can still remember your complete indifference as to whether the sun moved round the earth or the earth round the sun. Let me, therefore, return to the facts concerning Sir Henry Baskerville. That's a reference to the very first Sherlock Holmes story, where Watson draws off a list of the peculiarities of his new roommate, and one of them that he's shocked to find is that Holmes appears not to know that the earth goes around the sun, as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and it's later, it's later given in that story that Holmes doesn't know this because it's not practical for him to know it. Of course, it is practical, <laughs> incredibly practical. It was a little, a little Philip on Doyle's part uh, to impress the reader on the fact that this is a thinking brain, this is a thinking machine that, uh, that leaves out all excess matter of any kind, even something as basic as the heliocentric model. Uh, Doyle, of course, writing in an era 100 years ago, little guessing that, that in America, for instance, in the United States, 60% of the population would either not know that the Earth goes around the sun and not the other way around, or not believe it when they're told. <laughs> uh, uh, let me therefore return to the facts concerning Sir Henry Baskerville. If you have not yet had any report within the last few days, it is because uh, up, to day, up, up to today there was nothing of importance to relate. There was a very surprising circumstance occurred, which I shall tell you in due course. But first of all, I must keep you in touch with some of the other factors in the situation. One of these, concerning which I have said little, is the escape of convict upon the moor. There is a strong reason to, now to believe that he has got right away, which is a considerable relief to the lonely householders of the district. A fortnight has passed since his flight, during which he has not been seen and nothing has been heard of him. It is surely inconceivable that he could have held out upon the moor during all that time. I could have. So he could of course, so far as his concealment goes, there is no difficulty at all. Any one of these stone huts would give him a hiding place. And who knows those stone huts? But there is nothing to eat unless he were to catch and slaughter one of the moor sheep. We think, therefore, that he has gone, and outlying farmers sleep the better in consequence. Nothing to eat. <laughs> nothing to eat. You could actually get fat 
on the, on the animals that live in the moor. Uh, we are four able-bodied men in this household, so that we could take good care of ourselves, but I confess that I had, have had uneasy moments when I have thought of the stablemen. They live miles from any help. They are one maid, an old manservant, the sister, and the brother, the latter not a very strong man. They would be helpless in the hands of a desperate fellow like this Notting Hill criminal, if he could once effect an entrance. But Sir Henry and I are concerned, both Sir Henry and I are concerned at their situation, and it was suggested that Perkins the groom should go over to sleep there, but Stapleton would not hear of it. The fact is that our friend the baronet begins to display a considerable interest in, the fair, in our fair neighbor. It is not to be wondered at, for time hangs heavily in this lonely spot to an active man like him, and she is a fascinating and beautiful woman. Um, Watson, you have yet to tell us whether or not Baskerville Hall has a library. If it does, well, <laughs> there goes the boredom. Uh, anyway, maybe he's not a reader. Uh, there is something tropical and exotic about her which forms a singular contrast to her cool and unemotional brother. Yet he also gives the idea of hidden fires. He is certainly a very marked influence over her, for I have seen her continually glance at him as she talked as if seeking approbation for what she said. I trust that he is kind to her. There is a little dry glitter in his eyes and a firm set in his lip, which goes uh, with a positive and possibly harsh nature. You would find him an interesting study. He came over to call upon Baskerville on that first day, and the very next morning he took us both to show us the spot where the legend of the wicked Hugo is supposed to have had its origin. It was an excursion of some miles across the moor to a place which is so dismal that it might have suggested the story. We found a short valley between rugged tors which led to an open, grassy space flecked over with white cotton grass. In the middle of it rose two great stones, worn and, sh and sharpened at the upper end, until they looked like the huge, corroding fangs of some monstrous beast. In every way it corresponded with the scene of the old tragedy. Sir Henry was much interested, and asked Steepleton more than once whether he did really believe in the possibility of the interference of the supernatural in the affairs of men. He spoke lightly, but it was evident that he was very much in earnest. Stapleton was guarded in his replies, but it was easy to see that he had said less than he might, and that he would not express his whole opinion out of consideration for the feelings of the baronet. He told us of similar cases, where families had suffered from some evil influence, and he left us with the impression that he shared the popular view upon the matter. But he didn't actually say it, did he? He doesn't actually say a whole lot, does he? Our way back, on our way back, we stayed for a lunch at Merripit House, and it was there that Sir Henry made the acquaintance of Miss Stapleton. From the first moment that he saw her, he appeared uh, to be strongly attracted by her, and I am much mistaken if the feeling was not mutual. He referred to her again and again on our walk home, and since then hardly a day has passed that we have not seen something of the brother and sister. They dine here tonight, and there is some talk of our, of our going to meet them next week. One would imagine that such a match would be very welcome to Stapleton, yet I have more than once caught a look of the strongest disapprobation in his face when Sir Henry has been paying some attention to his sister. He is much attached to her, no doubt, and would lead a lonely life without her, but it would seem the height of selfishness if he were to stand in the way of her making so brilliant a marriage. Yet I am, concerned, I am certain that he does not wish the, their intimacy to ripen into love, and I have said several times observed that he was, has taken pains to prevent them being face to face. By the way, your instructions to me never to allow Sir Henry to go out alone will become very much more onerous if a love affair were to be added to our other difficulties. My popularity would soon suffer if I were to carry out your orders to the letter. The other day, Thursday to be exact, Dr. Mortimer lunched with us. He has been ex excavating a barrow at Long Down and has got a prehistoric skull from which, which fills him with great joy because <laughs> he's a phrenologist. You can study the bumps and ridges even on an ancient skull. Never was there such a single-minded enthusiast as he. The Stapletons came in afterwards, and the good doctor took us all to the U Alley, at Sir Henry's request, to show us exactly how everything occurred upon that fatal night. It is a long, dismal walk, the U Alley, between two high walls of clipped hedges, with a narrow band of grass on either side. At the far end is an old tumble-down summer house. Halfway down is the moor gate, where the old gentleman left his cigar ash, it is a white wooden gate with a latch. Behind it lies the wide moor. I remembered your theory of the affair and tried to picture all that has occurred. As the old man stood there, he saw something coming across the moor, something which terrified him so that he lost his wits and ran and ran until he died of sheer horror and exhaustion. There was a long, gloomy tunnel down which he fled. And from what? Sheepdog on the moor? Or a spectral hound, black and silent and monstrous? Was there a human agency in the matter? 
Did the pale, watchful Barrymore know more than he cared to say? It was all dim and vague, but always there is a dark shadow of crime behind it. One other neighbor I have met since I wrote last. This is Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall, who lives some four miles to the south of us. He is an elderly man, red-faced, white-haired, and choleric. His passion is for the British law, and he has spent a large fortune in litigation. He fights for the mere pleasure of fighting, and is equally ready to take up either side of a question, so that it is no wonder that he has found it a costly amusement. Sometimes he will shut up a right-of-way and defy the passage to make him open it. At others he will, with his own hands, tear down some other man's gate and declare that a path has existed there from time immemorial, defying the owner to prosecute him for trespass. He is learned in old manorial and communal rights, and he applies his knowledge sometimes in favor of the villagers of Fernworthy and sometimes against them, so that he is periodically either carried in triumph down the village street or else burned in effigy, according to his latest exploit. He is said to have about seven lawsuits upon his hands at present, which will probably swallow up the remainder of his fortune and so draw his sting and leave him harmless for the future. Apart from the law, he seems a kindly, good-natured person, and I only mention it because you were particular that I should spend some, send some more description of the people who surround us. He is curiously employed at present, for being an amateur astronomer, he has had an excellent telescope which he lies upon the roof of his house and sweeps the moor all day in hopes of catching a glimpse of the escaped convict. If he would confine his energies to this, all would be well, but there are rumors that he intends to prosecute Dr. Mortimer for opening a grave without the consent of the next of king, because he dug up the Neolithic skull in the barrel on Long Down. <laughs> what next of kin? Uh, he, he helps to keep, us, uh, keep our lives from being monotonous and gives a little comic relief, which is badly needed. And now, having brought you up to date on the escaped convict, the Stapletons, Dr. Mortimer, and Franklin of Laughter Hall, let me end on that which is most important and tell you about the Barrymores, especially the surprising development of last night. The Barrymores are the two servants at Baskerville Hall, and Mr. Barrymore has a big black bushy beard like the man the home saw following Sir Henry in London. First of all, about the, last, the test telegram, which you sent from London in order to make sure that Barrymore was really here. I have already explained that the testimony of the postmaster shows that the test was worthless, and that we have no proof one way or the other. I told Sir Henry how the matter stood, and he at once, in his downright fashion, had Barrymore up and asked him whether he had received the telegram himself. Barrymore said that he had. Did the boy deliver it into your own hands? said Sir Henry. Barrymore looked surprised and considered for a little. No, said he. I was in the box room at the time, and my wife brought it up to me. Did you answer it yourself? No. I told my wife what to answer, and she went down to write it. In the evening, he recurred to the subject of his own accord. I could not quite understand the object of your questions this morning, Sir Henry, said he. I trust that they do not mean that I have done anything to forfeit your confidence. Sir Henry had to assure him that it was not so, and pacify him by giving him a considerable part of his old wardrobe, the London outfit having now arrived. Mrs. Barrymore is of interest to me. She is a heavy, solid person, very limited, intensely respectable, and inclined to be puritanical. You could hardly conceive a less emotional subject. Yet I have told you how, on the first night here, I heard her sobbing bitterly. And since then I have more than once observed traces of tears upon her face. Some deep sorrow gnaws ever at her heart. Sometimes I wonder if she has a guilty memory which haunts her, and sometimes I suspect Barrymore of being a domestic tyrant. I have always felt that there was something singular and questionable in the man's character. But the adventure of last night brings all my suspicions to a head. And yet it may seem a small matter in itself. You are aware that I am not a very sound sleeper, and since I have been on guard in this house, my slumbers have been lighter than ever. Last night, about two in the morning, I was aroused by a stealthy step passing my room. I rose, opened my door, and peeked out. A long black shadow was trailing down the corridor. It was thrown by a man who walked softly down the passage with a candle held in his hand. He was in his shirt and trousers with no coverings to his feet. I could merely see the outline, but his height told me that it was Barrymore. He walked very slowly and circumspectly, and there was something indescribably guilty and furtive in his whole appearance. I have told you that the corridor is broken by the balcony which runs round the hall, but that it is resumed upon the farther side. I waited until he had passed out of sight, and then I followed him. When I came round the balcony, he had reached the end of the farther corridor, and I could see from the glimmer of light through an open door that he entered one of the rooms. Now all these rooms are unfurnished and unoccupied, so that his expedition became more mysterious than ever. 
The light shone steadily as if he were standing motionless. I crept down the passage as noiselessly as I could and peeped round the corner of the door. Barrymore was crouching at the window with the candle held against the glass. His profile was hard, was half turned towards me, and his face seemed to be rigid with expectation as he stared out into the blackness of the moor. For some minutes he stood watching intently, then he gave a deep groan, and with an impatient gesture he put out the light. Instantly I made my way back to my room, and very shortly came with stealthy steps, passing once more upon their return journey. Long afterward, when I had fallen into a light sleep, I heard a key turn somewhere in a lock, but I could not tell whether, where, whence the sound came. What it all means I cannot guess, but there is some secret business going on in this house of gloom, which sooner or later we shall get to the bottom of. I do not trouble you with my theories, for you ask me to furnish you only with the facts. I have had a long talk with Sir Henry this morning, and we have made a plan of campaign founded upon my observations of last night. I will not speak about it just now, but it should make my next report interesting reading. All right, so that's chapter eight. Barrymore, the, the head head servant in the hall, is up to something. And clearly his wife is involved. They are both lying to Sir Henry. I don't know how serious it is, but uh, Barrymore is holding a light up to the moor. That's got to mean something. Uh, what do you make of it all? What do you make of it all? That's where we go. That is Watson's first report for Sherlock Holmes. And we continue on. These, this report, these actually, these factual reports from from Watson to Holmes, are two important elements of murder mysteries. Uh, one of which is often ignored in the breach by murder mystery authors, but never by Arthur Conan Doyle. One is to uh, break up what you're reading. So it's just a just a plodding. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C narration, Doyle will often shake things up. We saw Bram Stoker do the same thing in Dracula, where you get uh, a letter or a dispatch or a change of scenery or a change of perspective to keep the narrative fresh. That's one thing. And the other thing is a staple of murder mysteries, which is that at, at regular points throughout a murder mystery, especially if it's a novel, uh, it's, it's good to come up with some way to pause and look at what you've got so far. This has happened a couple of times so far, just in The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's, it's always a good idea to do that, to pause and bring the reader up to date on all the stuff that's going on. It can be done very well. It can be done very poorly. It's up to the writer. Uh, one of my favorite examples of it is uh, Lindsay Davis. In her Roman murder mystery series, we're, we're dealing with a wisecracking detective and a highborn Roman lady, and they become romantically attached and eventually married and their conversations they the, the narrative action in those novels periodically stops so that they can have a conversation in which they do exactly this in which they test out you know, what do we know so far and how do we know it very very interesting way for doyle to do it so that's what we got for this chapter uh we'll move on next time <laughs> thank you bookies